Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Rounds presentation on partnering with primary care in the vaccine response. My name is Diane Liu, and I am a family physician and public health physician in the COVID vaccine lane at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we start with today's presentation, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. Zoom allows attendees to have the ability to customize your own view. You can do so in the right-hand corner of your own screen. Please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions during the session. We will save questions until the end of the presentation. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. If at any point during the session you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. I would like to state that as the moderator of this session, I do not have any potential conflicts of interest to declare. It is now my pleasure to introduce the speakers for today's presentation, Ross Graham and Dr. Sharon Baum. Ross is the planning lead for the Waterloo Region COVID-19 vaccine response, public health and emergency services in the region of Waterloo in Waterloo, Ontario. Dr. Ball is a family physician and pre-clerkship coordinator in the Waterloo Regional Campus of Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine, McMaster University in Kitchener, Ontario. Okay, great. Thanks, Diane. And uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure uh, to be with you talking about this important topic. And uh, I know Sharon and I are looking forward to sharing uh, the Waterloo Region experience with you, I think, but even more, you know, having a discussion about this topic and hearing your experience and uh, what you found to be effective uh, on this absolutely critical piece of rolling out uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. And I'm also uh, very happy that we're doing this before the big storm rolls in. Uh, so that we all have power and, and can be together. So uh, Sharon and I are going to toss it back and forth uh, between the presentations. So I'm going to go for a few slides and then uh, Sharon, I'll take it over. So uh, uh, similar to Diane, there's no um, conflicts of interest for Sharon or I. And in terms of an agenda, what we were thinking was first to hit you with the key messages uh, that we found. Uh, this is based on a paper that uh, we wrote up in tr um, trying to share some of our experiences if it's helpful to others. Um, then we're going to sort of go through, Sharon's going to go through some of the rationale about why uh, this was so critical to the vaccine response. And then we're going to go through um, what happened in Waterloo Region um, and really focusing on about five um, uh, key enablers uh, that we found to be critical. Uh, and then uh, some of the challenges as well and what we're looking to do uh, to keep to sustain uh, the model going forward. And then we'll revisit those key messages. We hope they stay with you uh, after the presentation and then really want to open it up for a discussion. So I'll just go over the key messages and then I'll, I'll turn over to Sharon. So the key messages uh, that we'd like to uh, convey in this presentation are uh, the first one being involving primary care providers should absolutely be central to all uh, vaccination programs, including the COVID-19 vaccination programs. And that means having intentional engagement and co-design with primary care from the inception. The second one is collaborating with primary care on mass immunization campaigns. It requires significant effort. It requires uh, you know, sweat equity, and lots of resources and things like that, but it's worth it. And there's a significant return on investment on uh, time spent working with primary care on these activities. And finally, uh, primary care, uh, embedding primary care in mass immunization is really key to transitioning uh, back to what we're all looking forward to, routine, uh, a normal, sustainable model of community immunization uh, post pandemic. So those are really the, the three key messages and we'll, we'll try to uh, back them up with some of our information as we go through. So I'm going to turn it over to Sharon to go through some of the uh, the background here. Thank you. So one of the pieces that uh, was very important was really um, the acknowledgement and the common understanding uh, amongst task force members, of course, our public health and our regional structure uh, about primary care and its role in this space. So um, we all agree that primary care plays a key role, always has with patient and vaccine uptake uh, in the public. 
And we do that in our offices through the entire cycle, uh, life cycle of patients from pediatric vaccines starting at two months to adult vaccination and boosters through flu campaigns and engaging with our older adults. And so with that said, you know, again, really understanding the key role that primary care plays in addressing vaccine hesitancy, promoting uptake and building confidence. And we do this in myriad ways, and this is why we're well positioned. So one is really those individualized discussions that happen in a safe place where, where patients don't feel that they're going to be accused of being conspiracists, but rather they feel the safety of the trusting relationship built between patient and clinician to be able to ask questions and expose a vulnerability and, and maybe a lack of understanding or, or some of their specific concerns. The second is really the specific individualized knowledge that we have. Many questions, particularly at the beginning, really involved person's own medical conditions, their understanding of their eligibility as an example, and really what medications they were on. And Family physicians and, and nurse practitioners are well qualified to address those in general, but in the context of in your own office with your own patients, you have that information, that knowledge already. We're also accessible to many higher risk groups. So if we think about the mass immunization clinics in our region that were hosted by team-based sites and later on by smaller practices, really that allowed a geographic distribution that really spoke to equity, that allowed folks who had um, attachment to rural practices, to CHCs in higher priority neighborhoods, really allowed them to go to a space that was familiar to them, um, that perhaps was more accessible because of mobility, language, health literacy issues or other concerns. And finally, we have a role in promoting vaccination more broadly in the public. We have that voice of authority and that credibility, which is extremely important to um, rely on. And so there is evidence um, that really starting any novel immunization program is less likely to be successful without primary care support. And so I think it has to be acknowledged that provincially, I mean, there has been some, uh, some concerns about primary care, family physicians, not being uh, necessarily engaged uh, to the extent that we would like at the beginning of the rollout. Really uh, questions about where is primary care, where are family doctors in this rollout, which is ultimately a community vaccination program. And this is not unique to Ontario. This is something that we've seen in other provinces and certainly other countries as well. And so, you know, again, that it's unfortunate, but I think there were certainly huge swaths of, of primary care that did feel disengaged from the larger conversation, and yet were being looked to by patients and by the public for answers. Um, a recent survey across Canadian physicians of different specialties did show that the vast majority of them saw vaccine distribution as an important priority, but 40% were frustrated with the level of physician engagement. And so now we're going to speak about our Waterloo region experience. Over to Ross. So the first thing we thought might be useful just to give you a sense of, of context that I want to take for granted that everyone knows all about water the region um, and certainly these factors are important to understanding uh, the enablers and challenges that uh, that we experience. So for water the region it is a two tiered regional government um, uh, and public health is part of the regional structure. Yeah, we're called an, one, an integrated health unit versus being an autonomous health unit so they're we're right in there with our you know social services land use planning colleagues. Uh, there's about 630,000 uh, uh, residents or students uh, that live in Waterloo Region, and it is a mixture of urban rural um, uh, geography with sort of uh, three major urban areas, the three cities, often called the Tri-City, and then there's a surrounding rural area. We have two Ontario health teams that uh, cover this entire geography and the population, and it's really the 401 highway that kind of divides them, if you want to understand uh, KW that way. And it is a diverse population and what we call quickly diversifying. So every time we get new census information, we see that Waterloo Region is becoming more diverse in terms of uh, ethnocultural factors, languages spoken at home, and now it's considered quite a diverse community. And another, maybe lastly important thing to understand is that it's uh, largely considered politically stable. And uh, you know, there's different ways people would define this and some may disagree, but what this does is it allows, uh, a, a, I think an ease of understanding of what's happening at the political level and at the uh, sort of health and the bureaucratic level and allows for more um, collaboration, innovation, things like that, uh, which we think was really important. 
And so I, we really think that this slide is a particularly important one to anchor the conversation because primary care was literally involved from day one. Um, primary care leadership, uh, there was a primary care physician lead position on our 12 member task force. Uh, there were also primary care lead roles on most of our senior committees, including our kind of mothership, the sequencing and clinic operations committee, and all of our operations groups had um, some level of co-leadership um, with, uh, with those clinic modalities. We were also uh, invited to really be involved with the co-design of the master plan. So before any vaccines arrived, um, on our, uh, in our region, we were really involved with sort of co-designing how would the vaccine rollout look as equal partners with public health and the region. We were also considered a source of bi-directional information because before vaccines arrive, questions are, are being posed uh, by patients to primary care. And so that conduit, um, as things developed, as knowledge was, uh, was being created, as planning was being created to be able to push that to the primary care community and bring patient and primary care um, uh, you know, points of concern back to the task force was incredibly important for that integrative model. And finally, there was extensive coordination activities that could be enabled by the physician leads to get going uh, in anticipation of the arrival of vaccine. And so this is a uh, snapshot of our very complex IMS, <laughs> uh, just drilling down on the operations lane. And you can see whether we were talking about our mobile operations for pop-up and mobile clinics, or our fixed immunization sites that were anchored and hosted by primary care, or the larger um, mass immunization clinic through uh, public health. In each of these, we had primary care leadership embedded at the highest level. And I think at this point, we wanted to just pause and there's a couple of polls we can do uh, to get a better sense of uh, your experience. And we wanted to administer the first poll, Lydia, I think. There it is, great. So we'll give you a, a few minutes, a moments to answer that. Great, and there's the results. I hope everybody can see those. Uh, really gives you a sense of the spread um, between uh, the different folks on the call. So great to have different experiences represented here. Okay. Go ahead, Sharon. And so this is um, one of those awful sort of <laughs> crumpled pieces of paper that you know you give to sort of project management. But this was just at the very beginning, just getting to the idea that you know we did have an equal seat at the table. And this is sort of my chicken scratch that that I submitted to the task force. But it really was sort of thinking through. Okay, if we've got vaccine sequencing and clinic operations as our mothership, and out of those we identify the priority population, the modality that would be best for them, how might that look like? And I really did not mean for the hospital to be off to the side in a small box. <laughs> uh, that was not Freudian, but I think I did sort of think that, you know, we have a product that's frozen, that's landed in the hospital, but of course has to be moved out into the community. And, and really when I was thinking this through, the mobile piece was very important. That's really those clinics that we take to patients instead of expect them to come to the clinic. And that's often our, um, our vulnerable, um, high priority uh, patients. And so those are then in the long-term care and retirement homes or in other senior congregate settings. Um, in in, uh, in you know, those who are precariously housed uh, or, or living rough and, and then other communities. And you know, thinking through that, those are places that primary care and health is already embedded. Places that we already had IPAC, engagement, testing teams all through COVID. And so really thinking through at the long-term care and retirement homes that there are medical directors and primary care physicians and nurse practitioners. In our uh, shelters, there are outreach workers and mobile buses that are already going there. And so really thinking through how might those mobile teams be thought through. And our public health unit and our regional task force was very respectful of the fact that these folks have to be engaged with and they are going to be part, we're not going to parachute mobile teams, but rather ask each of these settings, you know, do you wanna be engaged with um, building vaccine confidence, with actually administering vaccines and how much support do you need in this mobile team that's created really for you? And so in mobile, it was really that relationship between public health, primary care and those primary care based OHTs to lean into those existing structures and relationships. And as we thought through the fixed sites, we thought about the public health mass insight, which obviously would need primary care to support, and primary care-based uh, sites that were also going to be mass insights. 
and sort of thinking through how that would look like. Maybe at the beginning, that would be our larger resource team-based sites, running more regional clinics, and eventually getting to all practices to allow that geographic distribution and to give everyone a part. Next slide. And so this was a, a colleague who actually made this a little more palatable for the task force. And uh, this was uh, the same colleague who um, I had sort of described what my thought was and what uh, I was getting back from primary care. And it was really just a visual representation about these concentric circles, how as we move out from early phase one in the hospital into mobile and into mass immunization space, that volume and the involvement of primary care and pharmacy is going to be that much more important. And so just thinking that through was quite a helpful exercise for us. And this is the first official region of Waterloo task force slide uh, where we actually socialized this uh, table a fair bit to uh, both um, healthcare providers as well as uh, community stakeholders and leaders. And really trying to think through you know, how this is gonna look like. If you look on the bottom, there's a legend of the different sort of uh, ways you can get your vaccine from hospital to mobile teams, to public health led sites, to primary care and to pharmacy. And you can see whilst we started with those hospital clinics and mobile that very quickly in early phase two, uh, even late phase one, we're moving into sort of a primary care, community pharmacy, public health led model. And it was interesting when speaking with the leaders in our urban indigenous community who led and designed um, their, uh, their vaccine um, administration and, and their rollout and, and had specific asks for the region. One of the things that was identified is in addition to um, pop-ups in culturally safe and appropriate spaces, they really also thought in some cases primary care and the relationship the community had with their primary care provider would be important. And that really was a theme that we heard throughout the rollout. And so what the regional task force landed on was a five clinic model. Um, and it's important to mention at the hospital clinic from day one, there was primary care there, RPNs, medical office assistants, family doctors, NPs. Why? They didn't need human resources. There weren't that many vaccines and they had the hospital. It was really to allow that very early socialization of the fact that we have a part in this and to allow some COVAX onboarding to create some early champions. And similarly in the mobile clinics, there was a conversation with our public health unit about, you know, should we um, really go to agency nursing? Should we have um, community providers? And there was an ask that I had put out um, to community physicians and, and primary care. And within two days, we had 71 people who said, I would love to be on a mobile team. And I think that was the first sort of piece where we thought, you know what, this is a model that's very important to create capacity to get that COVID onboarding. And for those who've worked in mobile teams and pop-ups, you know that you actually learn a lot about clinic strategy and a clinic uh, roles. And that information proved to be very helpful later on. In the public health clinics, we have over 250 of our 450 family doctors and some community specialists actually on the roster to help support immunization and other roles at the two large public health sites. Again, another opportunity to really do some spread and scale on the capacity that we have on COVAX and in uh, eligibility conversations and vaccine counseling. And then finally, those two highlighted there are our primary care models. So the um, eight mid-sized clinics refers to six to eight primary care hosted and led clinics that um, are really at those resource models, the family health teams, the CHCs and the MPLCs, which have the um, infrastructure and more of a team environment. And we thought that they would be best situated to start having kind of a region wide um, mass immunization model hosted at their sites. That was very important. And, uh, and we have had through that channel uh, over 110,000 vaccines delivered, hosted at these primary care M sites. And then the smaller sites are really that commitment that we had as primary care leads and as a regional task force to the smaller practices because they, their patients are important too. And they need to be able to take this over. And so at the smaller sites, we said our promise was when we have um, plentiful fridge stable vaccine, we will be looping back to you. They had been involved with the other four modalities and they were ready to go. That model looked quite a bit different in that they were really focused on Ross to uh, immunizing to their own patients. And so the supports from the region were, were a little different in that, in that regard. And I think at this point, 
we'd like to do the, the second poll, Lydia, um, to help understand uh, for the folks on the on the call uh, about primary care's role in your sort of master plan. So we'll give you a, a few moments to do that. Okay, and uh, maybe similar to the first one, but half say yes, and then there's about half, uh, just less than half are unsure or a no. So again, uh, useful to have a variety of perspectives on the call. Thanks everybody. And so this uh, slide really just speaks to how different models can be. So those team-based, large primary care hosted um, mass immunization sites that work closely with the regional task force in terms of some supports so that Ross will speak about, that had a, had a very different community of practice model. We had a particular community of practice for them. These were region-wide clinics that were using the virtual scheduling system and there was complexity. One of our um, sites actually has 750 people go through a day. So, so really they needed a different approach than the fifth modality, which were the smaller practices, which typically had no allied health or maybe one or two nurses, but largely physicians and medical office assistants. And those folks needed a very different language they were only Ross, they were only vaccinating their own patients. So the regional supports were, were much less and really it was focused on a different workflow and different billing codes. And so just want to make that point how we need to lean in differently depending on the practice model sometimes. And so the result of this, and this is just one piece of it, of course, one you know quantitative snapshot, there's lots of different ways to look at this, is that uh, we had a high output, in fact, we had the highest output uh, through primary care in terms of total output, I think for a at least for a couple of weeks in July, where Waterloo was uh, outpacing other regions. And uh, that said, you know, we fully acknowledge, like as Sharon said, this doesn't capture the full primary care picture. And I'm sure it doesn't in your jurisdiction as well, but uh, in ours, uh, it doesn't as we had primary care uh, embedded everywhere. And so, yeah, and so the important point there is that actually only captures the primary care channel, which was the small practices, not those large uh, mass in primary care sites. So as of July 8th, we have 298 doctors in COVAX. It's a big win, uh, as Ross will know. That was a little bit painful, but uh, we're getting there. We have uh, 17 base clinics, which is actually a lot because we only have um, four family health teams in the region, uh, two CHCs and one nurse practitioner-led clinic. Uh, we have 35 uh, faux or uh, fee-for-service, but basically other practices, each of which have many doctors distributing vaccines. Uh, we have four physicians in the key vaccine leadership roles in the IMS and many others who are clinic leads uh, or community engagement leads or actually lead our pop-ups. And, um, and that's referenced there on that last line. So now I'm gonna go through, uh, thanks Sharon. I think that's a really good overview of kind of like the Waterloo region approach. And now we're gonna get into it in a bit more detail to give you a sense of some of the nuts and bolts. And you know, this is, Really, just from uh, uh, where this comes from is discussions with those um, uh, those physician leads, as well as public health and other players at the table coming up with these. And we've landed on sort of five top ones, but of course there would be others. Um, these are just sort of the five top that we thought might be most useful uh, to uh, to share with others. So the first one, as Sharon mentioned, is that importance of identifying primary care leadership from day one. As you saw, uh, primary care and community pharmacy have positions on our most senior uh, oversight committee uh, body of the, of the vaccine rollout. And we're involved in, in pretty much all aspects. I mean, either in a leadership role, but certainly in the design and in the staffing of pretty much all modes. And this was really critical uh, uh, because it's not like, you know, public health has some uh, expertise in this, but uh, everybody has expertise in different aspects of this. And it had to be bi-directional and, and building things together, sharing information. So especially as the information was really changing. It wasn't that you know one group, the hospital or public health had, had all the best ideas. It really had to be a, a partnership and uh, sharing information. It was also really critical to have those leads identified to get information out. Um, and this is important because you know, pharmacists or physicians and especially in different practice, you know, need different types of communication in different ways. And so you know, the public health bulletin is great. It doesn't always serve everybody's needs. And so having leads that are known to the community uh, to a liaise and do that timely. And what's really important maybe is curated information uh, to those different groups. And I think it's maybe important to note as we put in the paper that this lead role, you know, the formal representation from primary care is not formally part of the, the overarching vaccine task force. So it was a little bit of a different flavor in Waterloo region. 
The second part uh, and key enabler that we identified was what we call early transparent and regular sector-wide engagement and communication. So once we had the leads identified, man, were they busy. So uh, you know, quickly convening uh, uh, communication engagement with their colleagues and then looping back to the task force. And this was really, again, that two-way communication. It wasn't just pushing things out. It was, it was discussion. And I'll say, and it wasn't always about the easy stuff. Uh, you know, we had some very difficult conversations there about things. Um, you know, ideas were changed based on feedback as the way it should be, because we're talking with people who are experts in, um, you know, in nurse practitioner-led clinics, in running, uh, you know, primary care uh, clinics, things like that. So it was certainly a two-way piece. And in terms of the modes, uh, all different types of modes were used from WhatsApp groups to uh, more formal newsletters, virtual town halls, you saw a picture of one of those, to uh, probably the most, one of the most consistent would be these communities of practice, uh, which were uh, sometimes were tailored uh, for different groups, you know, the AstraZeneca group community of practice, at the smaller sites versus the team-based clinics. Um, and uh, that really, and, uh, or we bring them together where it was a common piece. And uh, those are things that we've all maintained uh, because uh, the change has not stopped, of course. <laughs> There's been lulls, but, uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure you've all experienced it, whether it's every week or every day, the information is changing. That communication is just absolutely critical to, to be flowing, and uh, we, we still do that. I'd also say just some really specific parts I want to hit on on this slide are some of the things around, around onboarding people. So it wasn't just around communication, but it was around once we, as Sharon mentioned, once we had some people who had used COVAX, who had experienced a clinic, and then they were part of the group as well, that enabled us to get more people on COVAX, uh, more people involved in the response. And it wasn't just always coming back to the leads for everything coming out of public health. It really did that community practice essence where it's a group of peers who have information and we're bringing on people all the time. The third factor, uh, as Sharon mentioned, is that co-design of the vaccine rollout plan. So, um, you know, uh, public health ha had a specific role in terms of uh, uh, authoring the plan, you could call it, but really, it, you know, good plans are done when you engage the people uh, with, with the information and the people being affected, and we tried to do that. So uh, we had those leads and representatives involved in the vaccine uh, rollout master plan or playbook, um, and this involved uh, early involvement with all types. You know, we didn't just wait till that last primary care mode, as Sharon mentioned, it was really primary care from day one. Uh, you know, you could almost somewhat, one of the phrases we use is starting with the end in mind. You know, we we're always thinking about, you know, getting out of this thing um, or how are we going to transition out from the beginning. Um, primary care was also very involved in the capacity building uh, in terms of uh, things around uh, COVAX and starting up clinics. So, I mean, just one specific example would be it was quickly identified that while the uh, resources from Ontario MD or primary care uh, had some use with some certain groups, there were significant gaps in what supports primary care needed. And uh, we responded with, uh, for example, we had you know, twice weekly, I think we called them vaccine boot camps, and everybody from primary care was involved. And you would come out, meet with our local super users. Other things we did was we quickly created basically a local IT help desk, uh, COVAX help desk, which ran seven days a week, uh, 12 hours a day uh, to provide local help. And we shifted how we design clinics and would set up clinics to saying, you know, the first person we want to know is uh, you know the leads. The second person we want you to do is identify who's going to be your COVAX super user, because that that was such an important part. So that really wouldn't have come without that bi-directional uh, uh, constant dialogue. And then another part here, I think, as we kind of mentioned, there is um, that early adopter piece. We built capacity, and then they could then um, work with their colleagues. So it wasn't always coming back um, to the leads into public health. Another, the fourth one we like to talk about is what we call sort of saying yes to in-progress strategies, which, you know, everything about the vaccine rollout was an in-progress strategy, uh, really relying on mutual support and trust. And it was critically important uh, that uh, the primary care sector, they felt like they had been engaged, they felt like they'd been informed, and then they were ready to trust that public health would be there for them, and that we knew that they'd be ready to seize new opportunities and to implement change. And, you know, one of the examples, you've probably all experienced it, we certainly had it, was the, you know, Friday of a long weekend. You're getting, uh, for us, it was 7,200 doses of AstraZeneca to go out ASAP. You know, if that group was not ready and already meeting, I'm not sure what would have happened uh, locally. It would have been a tremendous challenge. So, I mean, it was a challenge anyway, but um, that, that really enabled us to pivot and do things quickly. And, uh, and I, I want to also underscore, like, 
setting up a clinic, as all of you will have experienced, is no uh, small task. And so when we're bringing new clinics on board, bringing new small practices on board, they're taking on considerable risk. These are busy practitioners. And so they're taking on risk. They're taking on, it's resource required. And so it was really important that uh, public health, they knew that public health was there to provide critical support. We were flexible and would, you know, things like providing a COVAX super user, providing an on-site uh, public health nurse manager to come out if you wanted it. Uh, and then some key pieces around funding, uh, which we're gonna go through uh, in a little bit, um, uh, were, pretty, were quite useful. And also there was nothing that was, that was kept to a particular mode, as you may have saw, seen on the bottom of Sharon's slide. It was all flexible. So all the training and things and emergency plans and things that we had made for the hospital clinics and the big public health mass M sites, that was all made available to primary care as well. There's nothing that was sort of kept uh, to a particular mode. We're all in this together. I think she and yeah, and so reinforcing primary care's leadership role, I, I think the peer-to-peer -peer exchanges uh, were very important because public health has so much expertise in all of this, but they are not necessarily in the primary care space. And some of the primary care questions, many, you know, were directed to public health and brought back to the teams, but some were very specific to primary care. So being able to speak the language of different types of practice models, understanding, you know, locally where different practices were located, which were serving, you know, rural uh, areas, which were serving high priority neighborhoods, that knowledge was important, being able to understand the staffing models, the differences between patient enrollment models and fee for service obviously is important to doctors because they have wildly different staffing and resources, and understanding and being able to answer billing sessional billing, um, G and Q codes, and whether they're in or out of basket and, and how to build them and even creating a, um, a billing sort of guide uh, according to different softwares, PS Suite, Akiro and Oscar were, were things that we were able to provide with the help of Dr. Alarakia, who was part of our task force. So with the first hospital-based clinics, really wanna emphasize that the very first clinic had primary care there that was important to kind of see how primary care felt and to create those early champions. That was in December. In January, that ask about mobile clinics came out and there was such an opportunity to scale and spread some of that knowledge, really not only focusing on COVAX onboarding, but how to run clinics, how to look at different roles and responsibilities. And that put us in good stead as we tried to recruit for public health mass in clinics. People started getting a sense of eligibility conversations and difference between different vaccines. When we did launch our first team-based primary care clinics in February, March, we did it in groups. So based on geography and readiness, there was a group one and a, and a group two. And again, that group was really good about sharing and exchanging ideas and lots of support with the region, and a lot of cohesiveness. And we were very intentional about socializing that certain pandemic related supports like sessional codes, like the investments that Ross has spoken about were temporary and non-sustainable. The ultimate goal is really for um, mass IMS to close down and for this to be a routine part of primary care and pharmacy. So that is the longer term solution. And that looks different in terms of clinic organization and compensation. And finally, our first small practice clinics, and, and Ross talked about the AstraZeneca, they were really, the key there was to have laid the groundwork for that larger spread and scale, always coming back to the moment we have more fridge stable vaccine, you need to be ready. And that again was very important to be able to speak that language about the um, billing codes, especially because they weren't initially available and had to be held back. So I hope those were useful in terms of um, understanding some of the things that we found to be important. I mean, we're certainly no experts in this and that's uh, just pieces that um, seem to be critical. And of course there were lots of challenges and uh, we've got a couple of them that we just wanted to highlight. So the first one right off the bat, you know, it was who's paying for this was, was a, a hurdle that we all had to get over. Um, uh, because as mentioned, you know, setting up that mass vaccination clinic, uh, whether it be uh, I mean, for public health, for the hospitals, for team-based primary care, or even in the smaller sites uh, was a significant undertaking. So, you know, after a few, I would say very critical and pointed discussions and pieces back to the ministry, it was, we need to get on with this. Money needs to flow. People need to, they need to feel supported. And uh, that's what we did. So, um, you know, whereas just for context, for those who may not know, it'd be very unusual traditionally for lots of money to flow through local public health to primary care. 
Um, but that's what was needed in this instance, and that's what we did. Uh, so uh, we created basically for primary care two separate funding streams. Uh, one was based on those uh, those larger team-based primary care clinics, which really are for us. We're setting up five to seven day a week, uh, you know, larger sites. Uh, as Sharon mentioned, some of them doing about 800 or plus doses a day. Um, uh, is separate, is different from the, the, the needs of a smaller office uh, doing it with their patients um, uh, as appointments are done. So we had two different, we do have two different methods there of, of funding. And I mean, that's, it's a risk for them. It's a risk for public health. <laughs> you know, we're hoping that that be uh, reimbursed, but uh, it was essential that that be without delay. You know, we, there's no time to sort these things out when this stuff has to get moving. So that was a, that was a challenge. And so, you know, without putting too fine a point on it, um, pandemics have a lot of uh, breaking news, uh, lots of shifting parts, lots of things going on. And I mean, of course, we acknowledge that. Uh, but certainly, I mean, it does create some tensions, right? When you find out on a Friday on the news that uh, family doctors will be reaching out to their patients 80 and over on Monday. I mean, that does cause some consternation. So lots of work on the weekend with the primary care leads. First, to acknowledge on Saturday, we heard the announcement to good to know and you know we're going to loop back with some tools on Sunday and then really putting out Sunday uh, you know a template letter prime, uh, public health putting out an advisory on Monday allowing the uh, implementation of Q07 codes and so basically it's a very small example but it's just the idea that you know, being very transparent coming alongside really sharing the information from public health and the task force and really supporting public health's effort to make sure that everybody is on the same page and you know just understanding that there is sometimes distrust that can happen if that communication channel isn't there with providers but you know just sort of mimicking how patients feel just understanding that patients are going to be calling their family doctor's office on Monday so how do we support them for those phone calls and I think, again, this has been raised on many, many calls, and, and, and all of you are aware that obviously it's unusual for primary care not to have a line of sight on what's happening with their patients. So if my patient's up north and breaks their wrist, I will get a note from the rural hospital emergency department letting me know that's happened probably before they return, similar to, you know, multi-specialty academic clinics or blood work drawn. I always know what's happening with my patients, but I didn't know in this context because um, we were not given that information. There wasn't a link as our patients got vaccinated coming back into our electronic medical records. So definitely a blind spot uh, and a challenge. Now that is you know, now being supported through HRM e-notifications prospectively since, uh, since early mid-May. And I understand we will be getting uh, information about our rosters, first and second vaccine soon. And that will help us target um, those patients who have only one or two or uh, zero vaccines and really have a targeted outreach, which up until now has been challenging. We've had more of a blanket uh, outreach. And so what can you do locally? You can acknowledge that that's a bit of a pain point. Uh, that's important to do uh, and that people are working really actively to address that. And the second thing is for our own clinics, for our region public health clinics and for our team-based mass immunization clinics, feed forward to them that's important as part of their workflow at intake to ask the primary care provider. Yes, that information is not quite getting to us yet, but at some point it will. And so really trying to um, take the feedback from the local community back to the task force and making sure the task force makes some efforts on the ground here. And just to recap uh, the messages that Ross introduced earlier, we're hoping at this point that we've um, tried to communicate why involving primary care providers is very central to vaccination programs um, of this size and scale, how it should be intentional and hopefully from the onset, um, how certainly it involves uh, resources, as Ross said, with sweat equity, support for infrastructure, really setting them up for success, and that includes financial resources, but it's incredibly important uh, as they interface with the public. And finally, um, just thinking through strategically that this is going to land, what Ross used to call our exit strategy, uh, this used to land um, and is going to land in the community with primary care and pharmacy. So to make sure that you know, that thread is there um, and that's why we're taking this approach. And so we'll end with this slide. So at the top left, 
is the picture on December 22nd of our very first vaccine delivered in the region of Waterloo. And it was delivered quite rightly to a long-term care PSW from a rural home. It was delivered at the hospital in downtown Kitchener, Grand River Hospital, and it was administered by a primary care nurse, actually the nurse who works with me, uh, Teresa McConnell from Cambridge. And so we like to say that, you know, the first dose was delivered by primary care and we expect the last dose and boosters will also be delivered by them. Turn it over to our boss. Great, so that, that's the end of our presentation um, and would be, um, thanks, really appreciate everyone's time and wanna open it up, turn it back to you, Diane, for questions and discussion. All right, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate both of your, present, your presentation by both of you. Uh, we will now move to the Q&A pod to address some of the questions that have been raised. Please, I encourage the audience to continue to enter these into the pod if you have not already had an opportunity to do so. As I said, what I really appreciate about your presentation is it really provides an intercollaborative model for delivery of vaccines by community health care professional, professionals, including primary care and pharmacies. And you mentioned the importance of trust in the pri uh, patient primary care provider as part of the success for this vaccination campaign. I'm wondering whether you could comment on the feedback that you've received from both patients and primary care providers with regards to this model of vaccine delivery and administration. Um, so patients have been very appreciative. I think it's not a surprise to them. I think it would have been a surprise had we not been involved, I think. Um, and so, you know, uh, for example, I have a small family health organization of five physicians, um, and I'm the lead physician there. And um, I just yesterday and this afternoon after this seminar, I'm going to be vaccinating my patients. And I have heard from quite a few patients who are 70 plus, 60 plus, who had come to me for their first vaccine. Dr. Ball, I was just waiting for you to have it in the office. Um, or I was just nervous, Dr. Ball, about, you know, going to, because they have anxiety, going to a mass immunization clinic and I figured it was here. Um, and so there is that sort of opportunistic piece and that sometimes comfort that happens in primary care. On the um, provider side, just delight. And I think this is not unique to primary care. I think everybody who's been involved with those clinics, be they mass clinics or hospital-based clinics or mobile teams or primary care clinics, um, Dr. Liu really feels strongly that it's just very meaningful work. And so all of the anxiety that we hear from clinics when they're first starting, uh, their first vaccine clinics, they'll be you know, a little bit anxious, a little trepidatious. Why did I get involved? By the time we loop back on the community of practice a couple of weeks later, they are our biggest champions. And they're the ones who have helped recruitment because it's such meaningful work. Okay, thank you. And Ross? I would just add to that, that we uh, do surveys of, um, everyone who we can reach involved in the vaccine response of the volunteer staff and physicians involved. And uh, the response from physicians has been very positive. Everyone wishes the supply was more steady. We do as well, but uh, no, I, everyone uh, that those, what Sharon said is rung true in you know, samples of you know, 600 to 800 uh, folks involved. Okay. And I'm wondering, um, there are a few questions in the uh, chat about the actual vaccine um, operations logistics, given the fact that, you know, there are a large number of um, people being vaccinated across the age group. And just wondering, uh, the, the, the few questions that were related to that was, um, you know, we have a, a number of primary care providers, physicians who are concerned about providing COVID vaccine in their offices. And um, did pro smaller primary care practices find there are roadblocks to administering vaccines in their office, such as you did mention a touch on COVAX, the um, logistical software program for entering the data, uh, administrative support, lack of space for 15 minute observations, uh, etc. I'm wondering if both of you could please re reply to those um, questions. I mean, Sharon, you're the expert on this, but I can go through what the pack, the sort of the support package is that we kind of talk about with these sites. And, uh, and we mentioned the financial, but I'll just sort of go through it quickly. So, I mean, we do have community practices for groups. So there's open intake uh, for practices that are interested. And as Sharon said, it's from day one involvement in really any mode. So we encourage, um, you know, any, any able clinician, tech, technician, or student who's legally allowed to administer the vaccine can be involved in any mode. 
And then when it's a particular smaller clinic that wants to be involved, uh, the setup support uh, would include things like you can have a, they can walk through other clinics, mass in site, they can get any resources, or we can send a public health nurse to come to your site and talk it through with you. That's one. COVAX, we've mentioned, uh, you know, in addition to Ontario MD and the provincial help desk, we did in-person supports uh, for them um, uh, to get them, including sending your staff to an active clinic or to our boot camp, which was twice a week to learn COVAX and work with a super user. We also provide end of day dose supports. That was a challenge for folks. How, how you know, I'm nervous that I'm going to have high wastage. You know, information is changing about AstraZeneca or Moderna. Am I going to be able to use it? Well, we have a centralized method that you can call in and we'll, we'll help you get those doses out. We'll bring people. And I would say, uh, and then there's the community practice support, which I uh, don't want to, is that that group is there. It meets regularly. If you want to talk through this, connect with your peers. And then the financial support for smaller offices, what we uh, allow them to do is to bill us monthly for, um, it's around $500 worth of supplies, uh, costs. In addition, we provide the vaccine and supplies, but they can bill us up to, for up to $500 per month for additional supplies related to it. So that's sort of, and if I've missed something, Sharon, we'll, we'll add it. But that's kind of the support that we tried to wrap around smaller practices coming online. Yeah, I, yeah tremendous support from public health in the region, as you can see. And, you know, we did get those uh, same things uh, mentioned. So COVAX is one hurdle that, you know, we all know about, but lack of space and the flow. So what we did was we actually had just faux doctors leading this modality um, who understood those pieces and actually in many cases had been to those practices. And we walked through workflows. So one of our workflows was, okay, let's not be uber fussed about the COVAX. Everything has to get into COVAX. It's not gonna look like a mass in or a primary care mass in where you have a separate greeter and you've got a separate check-in and you've got a separate, and you've got you know different iPads and you've got to check out, that doesn't exist in the flow. So what we're gonna do at the beginning is just work on clinic flow and focus on that 15 minutes. And so um, options were in the evenings, um, having one vaccine day a week. Uh, another option was on, the, on a Saturday to a Saturday blitz was actually very um, palatable. To, to a lot of physicians. So that was uh, one model that we talked about. We talked about paper. We, we gave everyone about a week or so a grace to actually have just everything done on paper. And then that would be submitted to public health and we would enter it in just so that they could do focus on the flow and perfecting that. Of course, they had an obligation to get onboarded after that. And so being able to speak that language and really get away from a mass in public health clinic and really think about what are the barriers and one by one, the leads worked with each practice to help solution some of that. Yes, I think that is both like excellent in terms of how you're describing it, like really tailoring it to the needs of the primary care provider, primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, but also in terms of the clients and the patients, you know, what works best for everybody in order to uh, deliver these vaccinations in such a quick and efficient manner. Um, you both mentioned uh, the billing and there were a few uh, questions. And I know during the presentation, you talked about the Q and the G593 codes, but there were uh, a few questions related. Uh, do family doctors administering vaccines in their office bill H codes or fees for service codes? Uh, another question similar, what costs um, were the public health dollars allocated to cover? Uh, were your family medicine leads paid for their time? Um, and can you clarify the funding which is provided to smaller primary care clinics to make their operations more sustainable? Maybe Ross, you can start with that and then I'll loop back on some of those specific billing ones. Great. So I think I outlined the smaller site uh, kind of piece what we do there. For the team-based sites, our seven team-based site clinics, that's really what they're doing is setting up a clinic. You know, in addition to that, what we did with is a um, uh, created a purchase of service agreement with them, with the health unit, where we outline roles and responsibilities. We basically contract them, and um, and then we we would flow funds uh, for the roles uh, for for clinic staff um, uh, where they needed reimbursement. Um, trying to think, I won't get into the nuts and bolts of it here, but basically, I mean, we provide vaccine supplies. There were some roles that were provided directly by the region, which were uh, completely foreign to most primary care sites, like security. Security, you know, they didn't have security guards on staff, so we did that. And eventually we transitioned that as well to being a part of the primary care. So it really was, because there were times in primary, public health was, you know, 
overstretched. I mean, we're all overstretched, but we transition that. But uh, for so there's that small site piece that I talked about. And then for the bigger team-based sites, it was contracting them to run a clinic five to seven days a week, you know, from now till, well, it's going to end early probably, but we contracted them till the end of October uh, and, and a pretty big reimbursement uh, piece there. We, we, just total, what's needed to run this clinic completely in addition to what they're uh, doing for family practice. Yeah, and just to finish up, there's questions about the sessional H codes versus the Q and G codes that you spoke about, Dr. Lou. So in the um, mass M primary care team-based sites with that huge throughput where basically they, we just took over, uh, they, they, they took over the normal business of primary care, did that as well as running these large regional sites. Those were eligible for H codes um, through that partnership with the region, but for all of the for, for that snapshot of, you know, the region of Waterloo, primary care channel doing so well, those are the smaller practices and they did not have anything besides the vaccine ancillary supplies that up to 500 per practice extra monthly support for additional costs. And they actually um, build only the GMQ codes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and and just, the leads, sorry, there was one more question. So were primary care leads play, uh, paid? Well, there's a couple of us who, who work with Ontario Health. Um, so, so we weren't. Um, we did not submit for that because this is part of our uh, role. But um, for other uh, primary care leads, yes, they did submit leadership hours to um, public health. Okay. Thank you both. Can I, can I say one yes. more thing? Sorry. Just because I think it's, you know, if we've got any of the public health business administrators on the call or anything, it, for us, it's really, you know, I can remember looking at Janelle Hillier over Zoom and talking about getting to 10,000 doses a day. And so it's really, you have to pay for it one way or the other. Like that, like, like if we didn't have this, you would be, we would be, you know, public health would just be doing endless amounts of mass fixed sites. And really we had that option. We needed this option because of all the ways that Sharon talked about how it's different and it's really important and it's got great access. So yeah, I think the money was well spent. Thank you both, because I think it also demonstrates that there is flexibility in terms of the billing, uh, which obviously is, you know, of um, concern. Um, there were a couple of questions regarding um, like how can uh, you um, like balance running um, your own, you know, mass immunization clinics and supporting primary care, uh, you know, physicians, providers in this model. Um, yes, uh, were you comfortable with the involvement of public health, which was much more reduced as primary cares uh, became more involved? I'm wondering uh, if, um, and do you think this, the model is sustainable in terms of moving forward with vaccine provision in uh, primary care small practices? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll do the first one about how did we, and then I'll let Sharon, you talk about whether you think <laughs> working with public health, the, um, so it's right. It required a different way of public health thinking of its role in the response, because I can remember, you know, starting out with one planner, me, and now we have, um, we have seven planners and we have a planner dedicated to primary care and pharmacy working with them. Um, similarly, our COVAX team, you know, from really processing accounts, uh, to creating a local COVAX help desk and training program um, and, and uh, vaccine inventory. You know, this is, I can remember a very, you know, <laughs> busy weekend when we started getting AZ to building out a seven day a week vaccine distribution local place where you're getting it out to all these different sites. So it really does require public health to think of its role differently when you, and it, it's a coordination challenge. No, no question. You got fewer sites, it's more straightforward that way, but I think you have access challenges. And you're only offering a couple ways of, of people reaching it. But this way, the, the challenge is coordination and support, and it really requires public health to think differently. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Sharon, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think in terms of um, in terms of the public health piece, I think for sure, once that initial, I'd say, I'd say, Ross, four to six weeks as we were standing up each of the team-based clinics and then the couple of weeks in where you know there was 
extra support in terms of access to super users, maybe vaccine drop. After that, I mean, they have been incredibly autonomous and the primary care small offices have always been autonomous. Um, so the amount of public health pieces there, there's always solutioning around COVAX with the larger clinics. And obviously, you know, sometimes offices have to be ramped down or ramped up depending on vaccine supply. There's all of that piece, but overall they are fairly, um, they are fairly independent. Okay, thank you both. I, uh, it's lovely to hear that uh, collaboration and it really sounds like, you know, everyone had to figure out where their roles were. Um, there was a question related to, um, I did, uh, you did mention it, but did hospitals get involved in the vaccine rollout or was it just primary, uh, primary care and pharmacy? And um, yes, that was one question. Yeah, so the hospital certainly was the first, uh, you know, to put up a clinic. After that, they continue to provide a lot of expertise and were part of our mobile teams, particularly around vaccine draw up and some clinical leads. Um, one of our uh, two public health um, region led sites is actually managed by the hospital, uh, Grand River Hospital. And recently we've had a transition for our operations lead actually to a hospital pharmacist who's on the um, task force. So definitely a lot of, I think, collaboration between the acute sector, public health and primary care. Okay, and Ross, is there anything that you would like to add? Okay. Uh, just time for a few more questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, so this was, um, you know, we were talking about uh, moving forward in terms of vaccinations in general. And it says, um, are you finding that there's still significant interest in additional patients coming for vaccine to primary care? Uh, interest seems to be plateauing. You know, how are we going to um, get the late adopters, you know, vaccinated? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I mean, that's where our heads are at right now. I think from, I think many regions are is getting transitioning out of the mass sites and going, we're calling it going mobile. And it's really what we mean by that is, you know, as many primary care practices as we can because of all the, the benefits that that experience provides and the skills that those professionals have as Sharon mentioned and really trying to improve uh, access. Um, I'm not sure I have any wisdom on it right now. We're uh, we've seen lots of demand, as you saw, lots of output through primary care. I mean, there's been times, I think, with the news, and Sharon can talk best when there's been ebbs and flows in terms of demand and, you know, communication and confusion among patients. But again, who's better to help you sort that out than your primary care provider? So I'm really glad that we positioned it there uh, for so many uh, in Waterloo Region versus trying to understand, you know, the latest news about AstraZeneca at a mass immunization clinic, um, which we do that as well. But, uh, you know, I think this model sets you up well to kind of transition and to improve access. Sharon, anything you want to add to that? All right. Um, so I do think that we have uh, one more minute for uh, another question. Uh, definitely lots of compliments to the presentation. Really felt that it was helpful. Um, how can the healthcare system support balancing primary care involvement in emergency preparedness response with public health modernization efforts and potential capacity limitations? Uh, I know that's a big question. <laughs> that, that's a really good question. I will say, you know, as challenging as this has been, it's been a, I, I don't think I've ever experienced a more productive partnership in terms of, and I'm not just talking about primary care, but but all aspects of the, re, the region. And the partner, like we try to compile the partner lists from time to time to thank them, and it is mm -hmm. endless. And that's that's just astounding. It's actually, it makes me quite grateful to be involved. But I know, you know, from a promoting health uh, and, you know, promoting integrated service delivery perspective, we want to continue that. So I'm, you know, I know primary care may be sick of us after this, but I think these are, you know, one of the benefits will be these relationships. And I hope we can continue that for other aspects of, of health service delivery uh, once this is done. And I think, and it sort of uh, exemplifies the concept behind the Ontario Health Team, right, about really kind of having that citizen and resident in the, in the middle and having all of these different services speaking to each other in an integrated and, you know, with the public health piece, that preventative piece being so important and integral to Ontario Health Team. So we're hoping that this collaboration uh, continues because it's been really successful. And a lot of credit should go to our Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Wong, and, and the Regional CAO and Chair who have just been so uh, open to collaboration and, and really listening when ideas come to the table. 
Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank both of you for your presentation. It's been excellent. It really provides an, an, an intercollaborative model for delivery of vaccines. Um, I, um, um, as we wrap up today's PHO round sessions, once again, as I said, thank you, Ross and Sharon, for presenting. I would like to also thank everyone, our participants who joined us for today's session and for your questions. It's great to see such strong virtual participation during such a challenging time for healthcare professionals. Uh, these, one of the questions was whether these rounds would be available, and yes, they will. To access past PHO round presentations and view confirmed upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, Public Health Ontario website, head to the education and events and click on presentations. This one will also be uploaded. Lastly, you can expect to receive the brief and anonymous PHO round survey for today's session shortly, so I will encourage you to complete this to help us improve our program. Thank you once again for everyone's participation, including our speakers. It's really been a great uh, discussion and have a wonderful day.